Right, good morning guys. Um, this is your lesson on realist theories of crime and deviance. So this is the handout that you need. It should be the last one that you've got, I think, in the packs that you got given at the start of the year. Uh, I am here back after Christmas. Hope you've had a nice Christmas and a good new year. Still wearing my coat inside S24 because it is Monday and it is freezing and there is nobody else here other than me to record this lesson for everybody this week because we didn't know that you weren't going to be allowed in. Merry Christmas. Um, what you will get on the board uh, at the minute is a lovely picture of Theresa May um, and a lovely picture of Joris Bonson and a lovely picture of David Cameron and a bit of a weird and creepy picture of Jeremy Corbyn. All I would like you to do is think about which one is the odd one out and why. So pause it, have a think about that, find yourself the realist theories um, handout and um, answer that question, which is the odd one out and why. Okay, now hopefully out of those um, four, you've picked Jeremy Corbyn as the odd one out by virtue of the fact that he is what you would consider politically left-wing, whilst the others are politically right-wing. Um, which is why today we are going to be looking at realist theories. Now you will have done realism before um, in stratification, so you've looked at realism but you looked at right realism, or sometimes we would call it the new right. So the new right and right realism, um, we can put in the same bracket, okay? Uh, and obviously on the other side, we've got um, left realism. Now on the board, what I've got is a um, sociological seesaw. So in your heads, um, what I would like you to do is just consider where the theories are going to go um, that we've looked at so far on this seesaw. Do they sit more on the right or do they sit more on the left? And I suppose that will, that will mean that you will need to consider what we mean by left wing and right wing. So hopefully you can remember that for left wing we talk about being more liberal and that might mean we want some change and if we are right wing we're more conservative and we want things to be the same we want to maintain the status quo so on the board you've got marxism functionalism subcultural theory interactionism left realism right realism feminism and postmodernism. when we come back next week um, we're going to discuss these and we're going to do this on a on a big large document um, to make sure you're comfortable with where these particular ones sit. Hopefully, you've at least been able to put Marxism and potentially functionalism on opposite sides of that kind of spectrum. Okay? Um, and you'll know that obviously because it's Marxism, Marxists tend to be anti-capitalist, wanting change in society, one in, for example, maybe communism, whereas our function is just the same as our new right, really pro-capitalism, things are working really well, look around you, everything's nice, um, and therefore they would sit on the political right wing of that spectrum. So, if you're not a big politics fan, that's pretty much all you've got to know at this particular point. Right? It doesn't get much more complex than that. It is going to mean that when we come to look at maybe comparing perspectives that you've got a very you're going to end up with a very nice comparison here today between what the new right think and what maybe our marxists think obviously the you know the new right and, and left realism will be at opposite sides as well so they're good to compare but i really really like the new right when it comes to crime because they are going to say things that are a little bit outlandish um, and a little bit different to everybody else so um have a think now about what you think the new right will say about crime and what you think the left will say about crime. And I want you to consider who is to blame and what we should do to stop or reduce it. 
Some of you um, who had the fortune of a lesson with me before Christmas, in that week before Christmas, ended up watching um, <clears throat> a prison documentary about a prison in Norway that treated prisoners in a very different way, that was very pro-rehabilitation, where the prisoners didn't have a cell, they had a room with a TV and an ensuite. Um, they had a mini fridge in their room. They went shopping at a supermarket that was made for them. Um, they had access to um, degrees, to qualifications, to working in different sectors. Um, and a lot of you were pretty angry with that. Some of you thought it was quite good. Well, it certainly reduces the recidivism rate, which is the reoffending rate. Norway's got a very low um, reoffending rate. But would that be a more right-wing, conservative way of, of treating prisoners? Or is that a more liberal, left-wing way of treating prisoners? Um, and then maybe you can get in your head some predictions regarding what the new right will be saying for today. Once you've done that, uh, we need to start filling in your key terms at the top. So you've got three, left wing, right wing and zero tolerance. So if it's left wing, it's a political view that tends to support the rights of the working class and is critical of capitalism. If it's right wing, it is the opposite. You would argue it supports the elites in society and supports capitalism. And then something else that we are going to talk about today, which is a style of policing, a policing policy called zero tolerance, which basically does exactly what it says on the tin. If I'm going to have a zero tolerance policy to mobile phones, it means when I see anybody touching a mobile phone or having one out, I'm going to take it off them and throw it in the bin. Pause the video now. Obviously, I hope you've got the PowerPoint open as you accompany this as well, because you're not going to be able to write it straight off. Um, straight off this, this clip, unless you've got very good eyesight. Um, pause it now, make sure you've got your key terms written down on the top of your page. Okay, um, we need to look at, obviously today, um, right realism is going to be our focus. Next week we're going to look at left realism. Now they do sit on opposite ends of the kind of the, the political spectrum. So they're going to say very different things about what the cause of crime is, they're going to say very different things about how to maybe deal with crime, but they are going to have some things that are in common. Firstly, they're going to say crime is a problem. It is a real problem that people are going to face. It is a big, big um, issue that we're going to have as a society. Crime is a problem, okay? And that problem is going up. They also want to look at the impact on the victim. So they're very, very conscious of the victim here. Now remember, none of the other theories that we've looked at before really paid much mind to this idea of the victim. You didn't see Marxism saying, who's the, oh, let's think about the victim of, of robberies. Because remember, the victim in Marxist theory of crime and deviance is actually the person who's perpetrating the crime. They're the horrendous victim of living in a capitalist world. Um, now, Thinking about the victim is something very specific to realist theories. Hopefully, in a second, you'll realise why. Uh, and the final thing is the, that they want is practical solutions. So, crime is a problem which is on the rise. The impact of the victim needs to be considered, and they want practical solutions. Three things that unite our realists. They all think that. Why is the question. Why might they say that, or why might they be unified in their view about these, um, about these three things? Well, remember, these are kind of political perspectives, more than sociological theories. So if you go back and you look at these lovely people on the, on the, on the board, no matter what they say, what is their goal? It's to have the ribbon on and be an elected MP, right? So their goal is to be elected by the general population. 
even if you're Jeremy Corbyn, who's going to have a totally different view on crime potentially to Boris Johnson, the causes and how they're going to deal with it, you're never going to get elected if you say, oh yeah, um, I think crime's going down, um, it doesn't really matter if you're the victim of crime because, you know, imagine you being like a Marxist and saying, I'm going to be elected on the principle that the person committing the crime is actually the victim. You're going to vote for somebody who's, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not putting my political perspectives here, but you know my view on Marxism, right? You're going to vote for somebody who's going to say something like that. Or you've just been mugged and assaulted in the street by the victim of capitalism. Like, you're not going to get votes. It's a ridiculous thing to say. Um, oh, um, what, what are you going to do about crime? Uh, well, nothing's all right. Not really too bothered about crime. You're never going to get elected. So they've got to say these things. They've got to say that they're bothered about the victim. They've got to show that crime is a problem that they're going to try to deal with. And they're going to try to deal with it with practical solutions. So they need to say those things. Because these are political perspectives. And in many ways, they're more political than anything else, right? And that's a big weakness of our realist theories, is they're not really heavily theory-based. They're more kind of political perspectives. So, um, we've looked at um, left versus right. We've got our um, three things that unite all of our realists. Um, now we need to look at um, the thing on the bottom page, which is scrub, which is a way to remember the new right theory. And you can see the word scrub written next to Margaret Thatcher. Did that because it's funny, and uh, not many people like Margaret Thatcher today. They think she was awful. Consequently, I wrote Scrub next to it. Um, now, Scrub relates to what we are going to be looking at today, um, and the different solutions or different theories that might explain crime. And we've got situational theory, control theory, rational choice, underclass theory, broken windows theory, and biological determinism. All of those will have a place in today's lesson. So as you're filling in the, um, uh, you know, what they mean, filling in the, um, not the mnemonic, what's the other word for it? It's very early in the morning, you know what I mean. Um, I want just, I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about why we see and where we start to see um, the new right come about. Um, so for the new right, they're obviously going to be quite tough on criminals. They're going to think that criminals and criminality is a rational choice, a decision made by the individuals to commit a crime. As you can see on the board, rational choice theory is something that we're going to talk about. They're going to want to punish harshly the people who've committed crimes, and rightly so. And they should receive tough sentences and um, you know, should be treated badly. Well, not necessarily badly, treated harshly by the criminal justice system. Um, and this kind of stems, the reason that I've got Margaret Thatcher on here, from a conservative viewpoint in the 1980s is when we start to see right realism coming about. Um, so it's a conservative view. It's raised in the 80s. It's going to be tough on crime. It's going to be tough on the criminals who commit the crime because it's going to be their fault. They're making rational choices. It is their issue. Um, and, and their fault that crime is coming about. It is a problem, we do need to consider the victim, and we're gonna come up with practical solutions to stop these horrible individuals who are committing crime from doing it again in the future. So, once you have written that down, and we've had a look, we've completed page number one, you need to turn yourselves to page number two, where you are gonna first look at one cause of crime. Now, we're gonna go through potentially three causes of crime reasonably quickly. Um, then you're going to look at some of these solutions and then we're going to evaluate this perspective. There is quite a bit of stuff for you to do um, as we go. Um, so um, you'll be set some written pieces of work as well that you'll need to be submitting today. Um, it's a little practice bits of writing and things. Uh, so there is plenty, um, there is plenty to get done. So we're going to start off with biological de um, determinism, right? And biological differences that are going to lead to crime. Now this is a fam very famous book um, by Charles Murray, who hopefully you remember from talking about the underclass, uh, and a Harvard psychology professor who sadly died before it came out, so he didn't get, um, he didn't reap the financial rewards of having a bestseller, um, and also he couldn't answer a lot of the questions about it. But it's quite a controversial book, it's called The Bell Curve, 
and it is a study on IQ based in America. Now it's got some controversial sections to it. Um, it's got one very controversial chapter which is kind of left to Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein with a, a scorn from, um, uh, you know, society really afterwards. They were treated quite badly uh, after publishing this book. Um, and the utility of, the, um, of some of the uh, paragraphs are questionable. But um, what Murray and Herrnstein, um, oh, well, well, we'll get to that first. We'll do Wilson and Herrnstein. So sticking with Herrnstein, basically, he's going to make the argument that it is genetics that predisposes people to crime. So when you look at Wilson and Herrnstein's work, which is a little bit earlier than Herrnstein and Murray, um, they're going to say that individuals are predisposed to crime genetically because they have certain traits like risk taking, low impulse control, aggressiveness is part of your genetic makeup and therefore because you've got a genetic predisposition for crime that's what makes people do it. So again it, it kind of and this is this is a nice point that you could put when we're when we're going to write about biological determinism in a second it like um, it, it arcs back to almost Lombroso's work here. It was the last time we saw some biological explanations for crime and deviance. Now, these biological explanations weren't very good because they weren't at all scientific. These are scientific. These are psychological experiments. Um, but again, it, it depends whether or not you're going for the nature versus nurture debate. Perhaps it's regressive. Good word there to be talking about biological determinism. Perhaps it's not. It's up to you to decide. But... Certainly that could be a criticism of what we've got here. So Wilson and Herrnstein, it's about your personality traits. Here's the controversial one for Murray and Herrnstein. They are going to argue that it's because of low intelligence. And they're going to say IQ is largely inherent, um, or is significantly inherent, as they show in the bell curve. And that's going to mean that some people have a um, proclivity to crime because they are not as intelligent as others. Now, another controversial part of that book was the chapter that they did on race, which suggested that black people had a lower uh, average IQ than white people. And um, maybe that might account for why in America um, there's a massive um, overrepresentation of black people in the prison system compared to white people. So, um, I, I mean, it's, it's bigger overrepresentation, I think, in this country. But that's, that's one explanation from, from Murray and Hernstein. Now, that may not sit um, really, really well with you, and it's interesting to, to talk about this because we can really get our teeth into this evaluatively um, and really structure a paragraph as to whether or not you think this is useful or not. So, the weaknesses that we are looking at here, there's a couple that I will give you, but hopefully you've kind of pinched your own from looking at that. First one, according to Lily, IQ differences account for less than 3% of differences in the offending rate. So it actually doesn't, your IQ does not affect um, your, um, or does not massively, hugely affect your, um, your level of offending. Number two, if it's biological and it's deterministic, biological determinism, right? This is deterministic, and deterministic theory don't take into account environmental factors. It's just kind of saying that because you're born um, perhaps with a lower IQ, that's the reason that you're not very intelligent. Or because you are born, and you, uh, and he's going to say that if you're not very intelligent it's because of your IQ, where maybe it could be the case that you're born into a poorer area with worse education, you're not read to, you don't have any of the stuff at home, you're maybe culturally deprived. Going back to Albert Cohen there, maybe, um, and that's the reason. So it doesn't take into account perhaps these environmental factors. And then the final one, and this is for one particular chapter. Um, it was considered by some to have a racial undertone. You can question the reliability um, of, um, of IQ tests in predicting um, you know, whether or not somebody is, has got a high IQ. Most people might say that for some cultures um, it's not accurate. You know, there's some, um, you know, some of them are culturally relative. If you get asked in an IQ test about you know, a regatta or something and you don't know what a regatta is, then because you've never, you know, from your, you're from an inner city, you're from the Bronx in the inner city, and you're a young black lad, then that's going to mean that you can't answer the question correctly. And that is an, another one that's up for debate in psychology. So it's an interesting cause for crime, but note, who's to blame? The individual is to blame. 
It's your biology. It's your fault if you're a criminal. The total opposite of the Marxist perspective here, which is why I think comparing the new right to Marxism is very, very good. They make a nice comparison to each other because you've got total polar opposite view here of who's to blame and who's kind of at fault. And you can see it already, and we're only on one cause of crime. Um, now, uh, you shall see uh, that hopefully on the bottom of page number two and on page number three as well, once you filled in that, you've got a gap here, uh, which is to practice your 40 mark writing skills. Now, we've not done a 40 mark yet, uh, and we will be doing so and plan it out and getting one done before your mock exam. But um, we need to keep practicing to make sure we know how to construct these paragraphs, even if we haven't done one altogether. Now, Evaluate the usefulness of right realist explanations of crime and deviance. You are going to write a paragraph here on biological determinism using Murray and Herrnstein, Wilson and Herrnstein, which you probably would do in the first paragraph you know, of, of that essay. Evaluate the usefulness of right realist explanations of crime and deviance. Um, so, uh, firstly, what you would start off with is potentially... Um, your point. Who would who would support the idea that it's that it's um, that it's useful? So um, you would start off by saying, you know, talking about Murray and Hernstein, and you've got uh, Hernstein and Wilson. Both of those are going to go in. Now, here's the here's the question: is is how do you want to kind of angle this this paragraph? Um, could you say, because remember, it's a balance, right? So could you say the work of Murray and Herrnstein and uh, Hersey and, 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 and Wilson is useful? And why? Well, you might say because it brings a uh, psychological and a genetic element into the debate about crime. So that would be my start. I kind of go, right, well, could it be useful? Because actually what they're doing is it's psychological, it's genetic. And then once you've kind of qualified your paragraph here, you might want to call that some AO2, you can start by putting in the main body of what they're going to say. So this is where you could talk about Herstein and Wilson's view, and then you go on to talk about um, Murray and Herrnstein's view, you know, one on IQ, one on kind of characteristics and personality. So once you've done that, then I think it's time, and this is the part where now you can really show your writing skills, is your however, your AO3 at the bottom of this. Is this idea of biological determinism useful? You could make a judgment, perhaps, that, oh, yeah, I think it is really good to investigate IQ differences between races. That even if it did exist, what are you going to do with that information? It's a pointless thing to even research, really. It's only going to, be a, it's only going to mean that a load of <laughs> far-right supremacists are going to be you know, licking their lips and going, oh, yeah, finally, proof that the whites are the king race. I suppose the, the, the bad thing is if they did think that, they haven't read the book properly because it, it shows that if you're um, uh, Asian people have got a higher IQ than white people as well. So, um, but, but what's the point in, in, in showing this information? You might say, however, maybe this is regressive. Maybe this view of biological determinism and linking to race is regressive. It's going backwards. And you could say, like Lombroso, who blamed race for crime and criminality in the 19th century. So you can make a judgment. Now that is a judgment here. That's not one of the evaluation points that I put on the board. But you're making a judgment. You're saying, well, however, I've said it's useful here, but it might not be useful because maybe it is a regressive thing to look backwards. Like Lombroso did it in the 19th century, just blaming it on biology means it doesn't take into account the environment. 
And obviously, it might have a racial undertone. And then you can expand upon these points. You've also got Lily as well, um, and a point about uh, 3%. So at the bottom of your paragraph, you kind of have a little mini debate with yourself. And that's what these paragraphs should look like. You've started with the reason that you're doing it. You've gone on to give me, um, you've gone on to give me the AO1, so the, the knowledge that they say, Percy Wilson, Murray and Hernstein. And then you've gone, however, bang, I'm going to flip the debate over. I'm going to now say maybe it's not useful. And no, you're saying maybe this is a regressive idea. You're not saying I think it's regressive. You're saying perhaps it could be. You don't know the answers. Right, but you're going to have the debate. You can then link it to a problem with the environment. You can link it to the racial undertone of suggesting that it's, you know, that, that you know, his argument that if you're black or if you're Hispanic, because that they also scored lower than white people according to Brian Sinemori, that's that's racist research. What's the point in looking at it? And then you've got Lily backing it up that says actually IQ is not going to account for that bigger difference in the crime rate. So what I'm going to ask you to do is get that paragraph done. Um, you've got a page and a half to do it on page two and page three in your booklet, so you can pause this now, write it out, make sure that it's good, make sure that it's got the detail, make sure that if you are marking it yourself, you'd be putting it in band four for knowledge, band four for application, band four for evaluation. So you can pause this here, um, and then we will move on. Once, uh, once you've got that done, you're going to be asked as well to send me a picture of you with that completed paragraph. So. Can you get that done now for me, please? Pause it, crack on. Well, hopefully, once you have, uh, once you've done that, uh, you're going to turn to page number three. Um, is it page three? No, you're going to turn to page number four. Sorry, mine's slightly different to yours. Um, and we are going to look at um, Charles Murray. Uh, and here's underclass theory. Murray's going to come up a lot. So he's in biological determinism with Bernstein, but he's by himself with underclass theory. Now, can you remember what he means by underclass? Can you remember how his view um, affects the structure uh, of the class system, right? And how it maybe it's changed the shape of the class system? And what he says about the underclass that, um, that is the problem. So have a think, remind yourself, pause it now, you might need to go and have a look at your new right booklet from Stratification, and we'll come back and we'll talk about Charles Murray's view of the underclass. So pause it, yeah. So for Charles Murray, um, our traditional shape uh, in the class system, with three classes, upper, middle, and working class, is changed because he obviously says there's an underclass that exists in society. I can't simply extend my triangle, though, my hierarchy of class structure, to include the underclass. Right? I will need to change the shape of the system altogether, uh, and I'll need to make it into ooh, a diamond shape. I mean, that's the worst diamond you've ever seen in history, right? But I mean, upper, middle, working class, and underclass. Now. Obviously, I haven't drawn that quite to scale, but that would be a, a rough outline of the system, uh, the class system that Murray would think is taking place. You know, they think that this working class group are getting smaller because, guess what? Capitalism's great, remember? It allows you the social mobility to move into the middle class, but there's also this horrible underclass that form at the bottom. Now, remember, the underclass of welfare dependent. Okay, they are the new rabble. They are alcoholic, long-term unemployed, stuck on benefits. They don't want to get out of that particular um, that particular problem. Um, and what he's going to say is because they're they're welfare dependent, this extra money has done something to them. It has lowered the amount of married um, couples because. Money is given from the state so you can be a single parent, and we're seeing higher levels of single parenthood. So what he's going to say is the underclass family is largely single parent. And which parent's going to be absent? Well, it will be the father. So it'll be an absent father, single parent family. 
Um, and the fathers don't need to be there because of all the benefits that the kids are getting. Um, and this is going to be a problem. So we've got a welfare dependent, poorly educated, don't care, don't want to do any work group. And we've got within that group a high proportion of single parent families and absent fathers. And Murray is going to suggest that that is the problem because he's going to say that absent fathers lead to crime because crime is committed more commonly by um, working class young men. And then, of course, working class young men don't have a role model. So he's going to say the problem is there is no role model in these underclass families. And that is going to lead to the men, or the boys, as it were, in these groups, getting their role model from off the streets, getting their role models from people who are delinquent um, as part of like you know a culture of poverty out on the streets. Now, um, unfortunately, he's going to suggest that lone parent mothers don't socialise properly. Right? They don't have that ability to do so. And because they're lacking that role model, that is the problem. Now, you can agree with that, you can disagree with that. Again, imagine being able to write a paragraph on Charles Murray's view here. You know what he's going to say, you know that he's going to be blaming single parent um, females. You could say, right, well, <laughs> this again is maybe quite backwards. Maybe this is almost blaming the victims because if you look at the bottom of page number four, Jane Mooney. Um, he's going to claim there's no evidence as a link between single parenthood and criminal behaviour. Um, she's going to find that in London, if you are a single parent mother, you're more likely to be the victim of crime than you are um, a, a perpetrator or a cause of crime, remember. So, add drunken, you know ill-educated, benefit-dependent underclass that Murray is blaming and the women within it are actually kind of the victims of the system. They're more likely to be the victims of criminality. Um, right, we'll move on from page number four, and uh, socialisation of the underclass, to our final page, which is uh, on um, the causes of crime, which is page number five, and we have rational choice theory. Now, rational choice theory does exactly what it says on the tin. You make a conscious decision. I always think about that when you think about rational choice theory. You make a conscious decision, according to Ron Clark, who develops rational choice theory, um, as to whether the cost of committing the crime outweighs the benefits or not. So is it worth committing the crime? That is what he would say. Now, um, if, and this is what our right readers were saying, because remember they want to be tough on criminals, Clark is going to suggest that if the costs are low, then it will lead to the crime rate going up. And the reason why the crime rate is going up in this country is because we are not harsh enough, right? We are not likely to catch the criminals, and therefore um, that's why they commit crime. So think about what type of crime you might think where the, 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 the benefit outweighs the cost. Um, it's a shame, because this is a really good one to have in class. I mean, it's, you know, it's a shame altogether that, that, that we can't come in for this. But if you consider shoplifting, like I used to work in a shop um, in my youth, and we used to have shoplifters come in all the time. And you used to have to like, rest them to the floor, they try and leg it out. Um, you know, somebody, someone just walked in, jumped onto a bike, it was a sports shop, and just cycled straight out through the door with it. <laughs> it was quite clever. Now, um, what, were the, what, were the, what were the costs of shoplifting? The answer was nothing. Because what used to happen is, if we'd stop them, if we'd find that they were stealing a watch, or they were stealing clothes, or they were stealing a bike, or they were trying to take anything, they used to sit with security, we'd call the police, the police, the police would say, I can't get anybody round here. So what did you do then? Just take a picture and borrow from the store. And that was it. So Ron Clark's going to say, well, that's outrageous, isn't it? The cost-benefit analysis shows, what's the benefit? Well, I can get away with hundreds of pounds worth of stuff that I can sell for free versus the cost of what? Slap on the wrist by a security guard. 
I'll go and commit the crime. Now, I think a lot of you would agree, potentially, and certainly some of you are quite annoyed looking at the prison documentary that we looked at the other day, where you say, well, hold on a minute, we need really tough sentences, we really need really harsh sentences, and we need really harsh policing methods to, to stop people, to deter people from committing a crime. But a big weakness of rational choice theory is that perhaps this cost versus benefit um, idea is overemphasized. And I'm thinking particularly of crimes such as murder. Take murder in America. You know, you've got states where there's a death penalty, but there's loads of people who are on death row for murder. It doesn't stop them committing a murder, even though it's the harshest punishment. If you take a look at the American prison system, I mean, even our prison system's um, bad, but I think American prison system is worse. Such a vast number of people going into American prisons, they lock more up than than almost any country in the world, I think. Um, and the prison systems are horrible in there. They're really harsh and unpleasant, but yet people are still going. So does this cost-benefit analysis work? Well, no, and I think murder is a very good example that you could give when you're criticising it um, in the exam if you were writing a paragraph on, on rational choice theory. Okay. Um, I'm starting to get conscious of the time because uh, the lesson's starting soon, so uh, we will move on to page number six. And now we're going to start looking at some solutions. Now what you'll notice is that a lot of the solutions to crime are actually kind of based roughly around what the, um, what the, the right realists are going to think causes crime. So a bit of art attack, and normally we'd all be doing this, but um, unfortunately, um, only I can do it because I'm the one here. It's not your fault, is it? But I mean, you know. Uh, that is an house. <laughs> that is my house. Um, now, my house has been the victim of, let's pretend it's been the victim of a burglar. Now, in my house, um, I'm going to then have to do something different. So that house has been the victim of burglary. What might I do to it once that's happened? And the answer is, well, maybe I'll put in an alarm. Okay, maybe put in a burglar alarm. Maybe I'll put some bars on the windows, right? Because it's been the victim. Maybe I, you know, double lock the door. I'll put an extra lock on. Maybe I'll put a fence around the property. Maybe I'll get a guard dog. I mean, I don't even know what that is, but, you know, that's a guard dog. Um, maybe, you know, maybe I'll put a, maybe I'll put a, a gun on the, uh, on the roof. Um, that is an example of what some people will do after they've been burgled. And what you've got there uh, is a lovely house on the left that is the potential um, target for crime, but on the right, you've got a house with a machine gun on the roof, which nobody is going to go near. And what we have here is a practical solution called target hardening, situational theory. Um, it's basically making crime less attractive. And guess who thought of it? Ron Clark. Why would it make perfect sense that Ron Clark who we just heard about with rational choice theory, should develop this idea of target hardening, situational theory. Hopefully, it's because you know that as a criminal, if I'm walking down the street and I see this house, I go, burglar alarm, dog, um, machine gun. What are the chances of me being caught here and what are the dangers? Far more danger of being caught, being locked up, being hurt than what I could steal. But over here, I've got a really basic house with no security, that's the one that I am going to target. And I know a lot of you will go, well, in, the, in this house there might be more stuff because there's more stuff on the, um, you know, there's, the, the, you know there's, there's, there's more, it looks like they're trying to hide things. So some of you might go, well, that'll be the house that, that I rob. Well, a few wouldn't think that, but you might think that's the one that they, that they go to. But actually, the statistics don't show that. Remember, who's most likely to be the victim of crime? Well, it is working class people 
uh, as well as the fact that working class are going to be perpetrators. So it's working class houses that are more likely to be targeted for burglary. So um, target hardening, basically it's making things less attractive. Um, and the police and security services will use Ron Clark's idea to make homes and places of work and businesses to make them look or to put people off going to them because there's more security in place there. Um, obviously that will link to the idea that because crime is a choice, a rational choice, then that is a measure that you could employ. So if I was you and I was writing my essay and I did rational choice, I would put almost rational choice and target harming together in a paragraph because it, it's the solution um, as, well as, the, as, as well as giving the reason for criminality. Now, some evaluation points here for Clark's theory, which I'm gonna need you to pause and fill in, um, is the police are often ones who will talk about using target hardening uh, as a way of deterring crime. Um, so you'll see here, um, I think I took this from a local police handbook, and this is one of their interventions in local projects which is putting up lockable gates to stop people going through what I think you would call gimmels here. That's not what we call them back in the right country. They don't have a name. But, um, so, um, so it is used and it is promoted by the police. Um, however, this kind of controls the disorder rather than tackles the cause. Because if I've got this house and that house and I'm a burglar, well, I'm just not going to rob this house. I am going to go and burgle this house. So it's actually not going to stop me being a burglar, it's just going to stop me burgling a certain place. Interestingly, when I used to um, run a business in the black country, an engineering company, we used to get our petrol siphoned off on a weekend, every two or three weeks at least. Um, and we kept calling the police and the police, or the police were like, well, what can you do? Um, so, you know, we put up big fences, which kind of limited people getting in the property and made it a little bit more difficult. But um, that, and we locked the, the kind of wagon away and put it in a little makeshift kind of like stall that we built around it. And it did stop people coming and stealing it. The target hardening that we practiced didn't work. Um, so that is your first solution to crime. Pause it now, make sure that you're up to date with everything in your book. If you want as well, you can um, you can draw in your house some of the lovely defence me measures and target hardening measures that I have done here. Please try and make sure that your dog looks relatively human. Right. Next question is, you've got these two windows. Uh, well, you've got these two buildings, sorry. Question. Which one is likely to have the next window broken. So you've got two buildings, lots of windows. Which place is likely to have the next window broken? If you said this one, happy days. You are starting to think a little bit more like a right realist. They are going to suggest that that is the place where the next um, window is going to be broken. Here, it is not. I mean, also because that's New Scotland Yard in London, which is the police headquarters for the Met. So very unlikely that that'll get a window broken, but not actually because that's what it is. It's because all the windows there are intact. What we are going to look at here is something called broken windows theory by Wilson and Kelling. And what Wilson and Kelling are going to say, and I'll put that, uh, we'll get it on the board in a second so you can get the full information down, is in places where there is vandalism, or graffiti, or in places where we see dereliction, um, and we see um, poorly maintained areas, crime spreads. So if you break one window, then the next window gets broken the next week, and the next one the next week, and then there's graffiti on the walls, and then inside it becomes a crackdown. That is the argument behind broken window steel. So what they're gonna say is, you need to maintain the character of neighbourhoods. So any graffiti, any vandalism, any fly tipping, deal with it straight away because crime breeds crime. So a little bit of crime 
will, will, will spiral into a much bigger um, bit of criminality. Now, this is a realistic and practical solution which people employ. And it is employed through a policing method called zero tolerance. So broken windows theory leads into something that we would call zero tolerance. And I'm going to put on the board now, because ho hopefully you can pause this boom, and make sure that you've written this down for broken windows theory. I'm going to put on the board um, <clears throat> an outline of, of what we mean by zero tolerance. So zero tolerance is an aggressive policing style um, where all acts are targeted. So things like littering are going to be treated as harshly as they can be by the law. Things like vandalism, prostitution. I'm going to be a police officer who targets that. Um, and this idea is that the role of the police should be keeping law-abiding citizens safe by making sure none of these things happen. Um, now, do you think it's a good or a bad idea for police to target small offences like littering, like graffiti, like vandalism, like prostitution, to treat them very strict and to potentially end up with sending people to prisons or giving out vast amounts of tickets for these things. Jaywalking in America is another one. Um, do you think that's good? Do you think that's bad? Do you think it's too much power to the police or do you think it's the way that law should be enforced properly? What I would like you to do is watch this video. Um, it's about 10 minutes long, really, really interesting. It's about New York City where following on from broken windows theory, they introduced a zero tolerance policy and it explains what they think zero tolerance should do and why they put it in place, but also some of the cons and potentially some of the pros to using zero tolerance. And then when we come back, we're going to look at the strengths and the weaknesses of it. Watch it now. Okay, you've um, just looked at your zero tolerance, and it's quite interesting um, clip, isn't it? I, I really think it's a, a good debate on zero tolerance, a really interesting one. Um, as you saw, zero tolerance has worked very effectively in New York City, lowering a murder rate by 82% according to Zimring's research. It's had a fantastic impact, or so the right realists would have you believe. Obviously, the problem that we see in New York City is the bias policing and the bias way this zero tolerance is, um, or this zero tolerance policy is used. The guy that, that, you know, there's a lot of different angles in that video. Um, you know, some of them saying, yeah, if you use it properly and you don't abuse it, happy days. Others saying, well, it's always going to be targeting people of colour. Um, you know, which is in America what we what we refer to as, as as black and ethnic minority people, Hispanic people. So we know that it's going to be targeting those particular groups, and it does so in New York City. So is it good? Is it bad? Again, is it useful? Is it not? This is allowing you to have a debate. There's no right or wrong answer to this, provided you are using the correct. Um, provided you're using the, the correct materials, provided you know what it is, provided you can articulate an argument, and again, you have to give both sides, because this essay that you write on the new right needs to have both sides to it. You can't just be, if you're hating this, you can't just be slagging it off, slagging it off, slagging it off. You've got to give it some benefits. Um, uh, I mean, here's something that we are going to be discussing in future weeks, but it's a difference between zero tolerance, which we'd say is kind of like military policing, where there's a lot of conflict um, and the police are there in a lot of numbers, targeting people, you know, they're out on the streets, they're viewing, they're watching people, they've got CCTV everywhere, and really, really, um, you know, public order focused, versus what we would say is a nice kind of more liberal consensus policing, where the police work with people in the community. Um, you know, where they're integrated, where the community like them and they tell them information, rather than this zero tolerance military policing where they're harsh, they have a high profile and they're going in and they're, you know, dealing with everybody and locking everybody up. Um, so, our final, um, final thing today and our final bit of, I suppose, AO1 
uh, is going to be um, James Q. Wilson's idea of remoralization. Now, you saw elements of this in that video on zero tolerance because you saw one of the ex police detectives being like, you know, we need to instill good morals into these kids. It's the morality of the young people that's the problem. And James Q. Wilson is going to say we need to emphasize social bonds, make our social bonds stronger commitment, attachment, belief, and involvement. Um, where, what does that remind you of when he's talking about emphasised social bonds? Hopefully in your head you've gone, well, it sounds like Hershey. Um, and why would it sound like Hershey? Well, Hershey's a functionalist. And remember, the side of the political seesaw that they sit on is the same as the new right. So they're going to agree with some things. Now, he would say that this process should be called remoralisation, where, where you teach naughty people how to get stronger moral values and become part of the society. Unfortunately, he doesn't give much of a practical explanation for how this might happen. Um, but as a positive, you could put this as a support. It would be supportive of Travis Hershey's idea that social bonds and weakened social bonds might lead to crime. It just so happens that they're not very good at trying to find out ways of instilling those things in people. Okay, so uh, it's time to... Um, Probably should have left this right till the end, but um, I'm going to trust that you'll do this now and then that you'll fill out these strengths and the weaknesses um, in a second. So um, this is the final thing that you're going to send me today to show me that you've done the lesson. Um, and it's going to be your introduction to a question on right realism that I'm going to need you to write out. So you should have filled the booklet in. You will have sent me the um, uh, the practice paragraph that you did on the um, biological determinism and now to finish you're going to send me the introduction to right realism and um, paragraph so what you need to say is when did right realism emerge so when you're introducing it when do we see it raising its head it's all be an ugly head information's out on, on page one which political side does it come from so it's right wing, so remember the political party that we most likely associate with right wing. Here's a tough one. What does it think about official statistics? Now remember, sits on the same side as functionalists. And note, all of the people who we've talked about today, all of the solutions and all of the causes are going to be blaming which group in society? Well, it's going to be blaming the working class, usually the males and the young men. It's their fault. Either they're too thick or they're too poorly socialised or they're making a rational decision to do it. Crime is the individual's fault and the individual is likely to be a working class, ethnic minority, young male. Therefore, official statistics, just like our functionalists, are correct. Another Another important one that you put in every introduction, doesn't it, about official statistics. Um, who is it most concerned for? What does it want to offer? Um, oh, and, and here's, a, here's a really important one, right? Remember that you can't get rid fully of crime. On the very first page it tells you that crime can never be eliminated, merely reduced and controlled. So it's trying to come up with measures that will control crime rather than entirely get rid of it it's going to try to control it and when you compare to left realism that we'll do next week you will see then a theory which might think oh, well maybe i can get rid of crime if i change the way society is right realists don't don't think about that they are going to be saying right well we can't we can't get rid of it we've just got to have to control it um, what type of crime does it see as most serious? Well, it's going to see the most serious crime is going to be violent crime committed by working class people, which is which type of crime linked to the type of collar that it's going to be, right? So is it going to be white collar? Is it going to be blue collar if it's violent crime committed by working classes? It might be nice to say that you blame the individual for that. So when did it emerge? Which political theory is it closely linked to? You can put that together in one sentence. What does it think about official statistics? We said it's going to support it. It's going to see certain type of crime committed by working class people as the most serious, and it's going to blame them for that. 
it's concerned for the victims, it wants some practical solutions, um, but what, what is it going to say about crime in general? So can you get that done and email it to me please, or send me a uh, picture of it complete on Teams. You've got some room in your uh, handout, which is on the bottom of page seven, um, and also you've got the top of page eight to do it as well. Shouldn't be much longer than that half a page, unless you've got massive writing. Uh, and then we're gonna end with um, some strengths and some weaknesses. Now you've got three strengths that are already down on page number eight, um, and now you've got um, the, ooh, and now you've got five potential weaknesses and weakness prompts to think about. So thinking about what big factor does it ignore? What type of crime does it focus on? Is it solving the problem? We've just discussed a couple of these in the um, in the introduction. It's biased against a large group, but who and what do they think about official statistics? So note that a lot of the things that are the weaknesses we're kind of already outlining in your introduction, and then you're gonna bring it back and then gonna slag these off in your general evaluation of the perspective as a whole. So hopefully, it's, you're gonna notice it's gonna ignore the structural causes such as poverty. It's not gonna blame poverty, it's blaming the individual. It's gonna ignore corporate crime. It's gonna focus on petty street crime. Blue collar crime is gonna be its main focus. It's going to aim to control the disorder rather than tackle the real problems, and that's a massive weakness. It's going to be biased against the poor. I mean, you might have said biased against ethnic minorities there, and absolutely the case, but biased against poor in general, and ethnic minorities is a, um, you know, a subsection of that. Um, and finally, they're going to believe official statistics, even though there is a strong argument which would suggest that they are socially constructed. All right, so... Um, I'm hoping at this particular point that you have a complete and filled out booklet on page eight um, for right realism, which is such a shame that we can't do it in class because it's most definitely my favourite of the social theories. Um, so, um, so yeah, can you make sure that you've got that done? You need to have written your introduction and you also need to have written that 40 mark practice paragraph on biological determinism. Um, both of those should be sent to me, so you should have already sent those now, um, and that needs to be filled out. Remember, next week you have got a key writer's test. We're going to do it in class um, on everything that we've done so far in crime and deviance. Okay, so it will cover everything. Okay, uh, any problems, of course, let me know. If not, I will see you, um, hopefully, back in class next week.